the stolen tank rampage. San Diego, California, US, 1995. The M60 Patton was an American main battle tank that had entered service within the US Army in huge numbers in the 1960s. Over 15,000 had been built and had seen combat with the Israelis in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, as well as in the Persian Gulf conflict of 1991 with the Allied coalition forces. They were the primary series of tanks used by the United States during the Cold War, but by the 1990s it was being replaced in the US Armed Forces by the new M1 Abrams tank and was therefore in the process of being phased out of frontline service and placed into the US Army Reserve. So what was one of these 52-ton beasts doing rampaging around downtown San Diego in California on a warm summer's evening in 1995? The tank in question belonged to the National Guard and was being stored at their armory facility in central San Diego. It was an A3 variant armed with the latest version of the 105mm cannon and a coaxial mounted 7.62mm machine gun. It also had a vastly improved fire control system, which included a laser-assisted gun sight, and its armor had been upgraded so that in places it was up to a foot thick. The stolen tank's main gun was deadly capable of firing rounds up to a staggering two and a half miles away with pinpoint accuracy. It was also armed with a medium machine gun embedded in the turret next to the main gun that could shoot at an incredible rate of fire. So, despite the basic design being over 30 years old, it was still a deadly and highly efficient killing machine. Thankfully, no ammunition was on board this stolen tank and this was stored separately at the armory when the tanks were not in use. This particular M60 A3 Patton had been stolen by mentally troubled and disgruntled ex-US Army tank driver Sean Nelson. The 35-year-old had simply driven up to the unguarded armory, drove through its unlocked main gates, and started to roam around the facility freely. Despite there being a large number of military personnel on duty at the time, no one seemed to notice Nelson wandering around. The security at the armory was to come into much criticism, as no one approached Nelson as he attempted to unsuccessfully start two of the tanks. These style of tanks did not require any kind of key or code to get them started. He simply fired up the engine by pushing on a starter button and put it into gear to get moving. Nelson then got lucky when the third tank started up. Only then was he challenged by a curious guard. but. By then, it was too late as Nelson simply drove off, leaving the bewildered soldier no choice but to run to the nearest guard post to phone the police and tell them one of their tanks had just been stolen. So who was this Sean Nelson? Well, he had been born in Utah, and as soon as he graduated high school, he joined the Army. He only served for two years, spending most of that time as a tank driver with the U.S. Army Battalion in West Germany. It seemed Nelson was always in trouble with his commanding officers and was honorably discharged from the Army in 1980 at the age of 21. And during the 1980s, he seemed to put his trouble past behind him and for the next few years adjusted well to civilian life. He set up and ran a successful plumbing business and settled down and married a legal secretary, having a calm life for six years. His problems started to mount up as both his business and marriage started to run into trouble in the late 1980s, and he started using drugs again. In 1988, his beloved mother had died, and in 1990, Nelson's wife finally divorced him after seven years of marriage. The same year, he was in a motorcycle accident which left him with some permanent back injuries that would make it difficult for him to work as regularly as he needed or wanted to. He later filed a lawsuit against the hospital for malpractice, but he didn't win. Nelson blamed the same hospital for the death of his mother. To add to his troubles in 1992, his father, whom he was extremely close to, died unexpectedly. After this, Nelson increasingly turned to alcohol and drugs for comfort. By 1995, he was seriously in debt when his work van and plumbing tools were stolen, bringing his business to a grinding halt. His insurance didn't fully cover the loss, and he was now unable to work and his old back injury was causing him a lot of pain. Then, that spring, his water and electricity were cut off because he had not paid the bills. As well, the bank had started proceedings to repossess his home as he had not paid the mortgage in months. Nelson was now heavily addicted to crystal meth, using it in a hopeless attempt to dull all the physical and emotional pain he was feeling at the time. As with most addicts, it made Nelson more aggressive and at times violent. 
he started to become more mentally unstable and was having paranoid delusions. He even dug a 17-foot deep shaft in his backyard, wrongly convinced that there was gold down there. His girlfriend Michelle, who had been living with him, now left Nelson, which according to friends made him extremely depressed and suicidal. All of this seemed to cause Nelson to have some kind of mental breakdown and pushed him to a limit that had led him bizarrely to steal a tank from the National Guard Armory in San Diego on May 17, 1995 at around 6.30 p.m. Soon the local police were in hot pursuit in their patrol cars as well as the state troopers and TV crews and helicopters. Therefore, the chase quickly ended up being broadcasted live on national TV as the tank cut through the suburb of Clamont at speeds of up to 30 miles per hour, leaving a trail of destruction as it did so. Nelson plowed through numerous road signs, lamp posts, traffic lights, and electricity poles, as well as running over several fire hydrants, causing water to shoot up high into the air. He would crush approximately 40 parked vehicles. He even managed to inadvertently cut off power to 5,000 local residents. Oncoming traffic was forced to swerve to avoid him or risk being trampled beneath the tank's tracks. And despite a large police presence, they were totally powerless to stop Nelson as the normal police tactics could not be applied in this case. Setting up roadblocks was pointless, as was trying to force the tank off the road by ramming it with a police cruiser. Deploying stinger strips was also not going to work on a tracked vehicle. The police didn't even know at this stage if the tank was armed or not, so in desperation, they considered asking for the assistance of the Marine Corps base at nearby Camp Pendleton, where a squadron of AH-1 Cobra attack helicopters were based. But apart from the legality of using U.S. military assets to attack a civilian on American soil, there was the fear that one of the Cobra's anti-tank missiles could miss its target and cause heavy loss of life among the nearby civilian population. Nelson completely destroyed a large RV before he turned onto the freeway and headed southbound. A short while later, he stopped briefly to ram one of the support pillars of a pedestrian bridge several times, seemingly in an unsuccessful attempt to bring it down. There, as he was once again speeding down the freeway, he suddenly attempted to cross over onto the northbound side, but got caught up in the concrete barrier of the State Route 163 that divided up the two sides of the freeway. When the tank lost one of its tracks and was unable to free itself, the police took the opportunity to use a bolt cutter to open the driver's hatch and ordered Nelson to surrender. But he said nothing in reply and continued to rev the tank engine, rocking it back and forth in an attempt to free the tank from the barrier. The police felt they had no option but to open fire, and a single bullet hit Nelson in the neck, putting an end to his rampage that had lasted a terrifying 23 minutes. Nelson was to die later that evening at the local hospital from his gunshot wound. So why had Nelson just wandered into a U.S. facility and stolen a U.S. Army tank? Some say it may have been politically motivated, but apart from some of his outspoken views against the U.S. government and his supposed support for the recent bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma, there was no evidence that linked him to any organization. Instead, most people, including his ex-wife and his brother, believed that Nelson had suffered a mental breakdown, fueled by his addictions. The Yamaichi War, Kansai Region, Japan, 1985 through 1989. The Yamaichi War was a feud mainly fought in the south-central Japanese region of Kansai, between the Yamaguchi Gumi and Ichiwakai gangster syndicates in the 1980s. Though its roots were in 1984, when the Yakuza parent gang of the Yamaguchi Gumi was sectioned into two factions, the feud was at its most violent between January 1985 and February 1986. The origins of the Kobe-based Yamaguchi Gumi can be traced to a labor union for dock workers in the 1930s. Over the decades, the group evolved into Japan's leading crime organization. By the 1970s, they dominated the Japanese entertainment industry. They had control over boxing, wrestling, and sumo games, controlled over a hundred production companies, along with talent agencies and booking firms. They even rigged baseball games, auctions, and horse races. Much of their revenue came from the sale of drugs, particularly methamphetamine, heroin, and speed, as well as from running high-stake gambling events, smuggling contraband, racketeering, and loan sharking. The business was run as a blend between corporate and feudal structures, characterized by inefficient financial regulation, membership fees, 
a tributary system among the 600 member gangs and strict codes of honor reminiscent of Bushido ideals. By the 1980s, the multi-billion dollar network had spread across 36 of Japan's 47 prefectures, and the Yakuza controlled over 2,500 businesses in a wide array of sectors, from education and health to the gaming and adult industries. A tattoo or even a quick flash of the gang's badge, a diamond-shaped lapel, could clear rooms, close deals, and turn a no into a yes. The Yakuza's viewed themselves as gentlemen. Their membership was a privilege. Yakuza would even go so far as to practice self-mutilation to show their commitment to the syndicate, sometimes even surgically graphing an amputated toe to part of a cut finger. At the top of this criminal pyramid was Mafia boss Kazuo Taoka. Kazuo, the third Kumicho, or chief of the Yamaguchi Gumi, had been in charge since 1946 and was the man responsible for the syndicate's rise to power. He was dubbed Kuma, or the Bear, for his signature attack of clawing people's faces in combat. However, he was always seen as a gentleman among his inferiors, a man of reason and balance that could quickly resolve any hostilities between member gangs. Because of this, he became known as the Godfather of all Godfathers. But his 35-year underground shogunate came to an end in 1981, when he suddenly died of a heart attack. The Japanese criminal underground went into mourning. On a Sunday, a huge Buddhist stay funeral took place in Kobe in the ex-boss's honor. 1,300 Yakuza from 200 gangs came to pay their respects, while 800 riot police stood guard. Hundreds of Japanese entertainers were present, artists, actors, and singers whose careers had all benefited from the Godfather's generous investments. His successor was to be Kenichi Yamamoto. Kenichi founded the Yamakengumi Gang in the 1960s, which would eventually become a close affiliate to the Yamaguchi. As Kazuo's right-hand man, Kenichi operated as a somewhat chairman of the board for the Yamaguchi Corporation. But a few years before the death of his boss, the number two, or Wakegashira, was arrested for extortion and sentenced to jail. He later died of liver failure just seven months after the death of Kazuo. The syndicate, now headless, was thrown into complete disarray. Police crackdowns were also on the rise. Internal division was creeping in among the ranks and rival gangs were capitalizing on the disorder to ramp up their influence. Desperate for order, eight crime bosses joined together to find a successor. A key player in this was Kazuo's 62-year-old widow, Fumiko Taoka. This was unprecedented as the Yakuza held women to not be fit for this kind of role. Fumiko Taoka's leadership was to be a temporary one that was to last only during the process of finding a new male leader. Two candidates were selected among the eight bosses, Hiroshi Yamamoto, a moderate in his late 50s who was affiliated with the Yamaken group and who was popular because of the growth of the Yamaguchi Gumi onto Kyushu, and Masahisa Takenaka, a bellicose but popular crime boss with a colorful criminal history and a personal favorite of Kazuo's widow, Fumiko. The influential Fumiko got her way. Masahisa was voted in as the Yamaguchi Gumi's fourth Kumicho. The election was a troubled one, and Yamamoto never accepted the results. Bitter at the outcome, Hiroshi broke ties with Fumiko and her loyalists, refused Masahisa's offer of being his Wakagashira, and even went to the press to vent his outright rejection of the vote. Many Yakuza also refused to recognize the outcome, calling the vote rigged, disapproving of Masahisa's temperament and sharing the belief that Kazuo would not have wanted him as his heir. On June 19, 1984, Hiroshi met with 18 top syndicate figures at a restaurant in Kobe. By the end of their meals, the leaders had come to an agreement. They were to secede from the Yamaguchi Gumi organization and form their own syndicate, the Ichiwakai. Taking the bulk of the parent group's arsenal as well as half of its manpower, 13,000 Yakuza now rallied around the newly created Ichiwakai organization, becoming almost immediately in the top three of Japan's most powerful criminal networks. The Yamaguchi Gumi were now significantly weakened and faced a new rival in the form of the Ichikawakai defectors. But they didn't remain idle. Though tension was high, the Yamaguchi Gumi took the high road and offered amnesty as well as generous retirement pay to all those who wished to return. It worked. Many of the defectors gradually went back to their original camp, 10,000 strong as the months went on. The Yamaguchi Gumi came out on top again. 
By the end of 1984, the Ichiwakai were down to only 2,800 men, and Masahisa was expanding his drug empire and criminal network all across Japan as well as overseas. Hiroshi was weaker than ever. On January 26, 1985, at least four Ichiwakai Yakuza arrived in a black car at the apartment of Masahisa's mistress in Osaka. Just as Masahisa and his two Yamaguchi Gumi crime bosses stepped into the elevator, they were mowed down by the four hitmen before the elevator doors closed in on their lifeless bodies. Within just a few seconds, the savage ambush had taken out almost the entire Yamaguchi Gumi leadership. The syndicate was shaken, but mainly they were livid. Within a few days, 1,000 black-suited Yakuza gathered to mourn the sudden loss of their godfather. This funeral involving a procession of dozens of Mercedes and luxury cars was even televised. Thousands of Japanese civilians kept their eyes on the ensuing chaos of a feud that they knew had just torpedoed out of control. In early February, Yamaguchi Gumi bosses met and declared 62-year-old Kazuo Nakanishi as successor. But above all, war was declared against the Ichiwakai. After a three-year feud that was relatively contained, Japanese civilians would now keep their heads down even lower, avoiding back streets and criminal hotspots, closing shop, ending tenancy leases, and staying indoors after dark. The feud seemed like it was about to explode. Luckily, the police managed to prevent a massacre. Over the next few months, around 1,000 Yakuza were arrested, and hundreds of weapons were confiscated through the rapid mobilization of riot police at close to 200 key homes and offices of the Yamaguchi Gumi. Nonetheless, over 200 armed attacks and 26 deaths occurred within one year of the vicious ambush. Masashi Takanaka particularly wanted to avenge the death of his brother, Masahisa. In September 1985, Masashi and Hideomi Oda, the syndicate's head of the treasury, flew down to Honolulu, Hawaii, and attempted to strike a deal with they who believed to be prominent gangsters in the American Mafia. In exchange for 52 pounds of amphetamines and 12 pounds of heroin, they tried to purchase three rocket launchers, five machine guns, and 100 handguns. The goal? To blow up the heavily fortified headquarters of the Ichiwakai and dismantle their whole operation in one bloody raid. They also requested a private assassin to take down Hiroshi in the event that he survived the raid. But they were down on their luck, as the gangsters they thought they were dealing with were in fact undercover U.S. agents who had even managed to record their conversations. The Yamaguchi Gumi bosses were swiftly arrested after a huge multinational police effort, costing them millions of dollars, potentially life sentences in an American jail, and the loss of respect from the syndicate back in Japan. In court, they tried to claim that they were in Hawaii in an attempt to book superstar Michael Jackson for a tour in Japan. The Yamaichi feud seemed to rage on and on. Anxious civilians condemned the killings, and some public bystanders were killed in the crossfire. Scorecards even began to appear in Japanese newspapers listing daily death rates. The neutral Inagawakai band kept trying to mediate. When an Ichiwakai member broke a ceasefire, his angry boss cut off his finger, presenting it to the Inagawakai to demonstrate his disapproval, as well as his willingness to abide by the group's peacemaking efforts. The feud took a dramatic turn when, in February 1986, an Ichiwakai businessman called Hideo Shiragami was found dead, his body floating in the sea. His ears, tongue, and middle finger had been cut off, his ribs were crushed, and his head had a gaping bullet hole through the temple. The brutal manner in which his body was found shocked the nation. The feud was out of control, and ashamed Yamaguchi leadership instantly denounced the barbaric slaying of Hideo and announced an end to hostilities six days later. Ichiwakai followed suit, marking an end to a two-year war involving over 300 shootings, which had left 25 dead and vast amounts of money squandered on firearms, legal fees, security, and funeral costs. The Yamaguchi emerged as victors given their vastly higher membership roles. By 1989, they clearly loomed over the Ichiwakai Syndicate, reduced to a gang of just several hundred strong, and which quickly disbanded thereafter. Ned Kelly, the armored criminal, Bush Ranger, 1855 to 1880. Edward Ned Kelly is Australia's most famous Bush Ranger. Ned was born in June 1855 at Beveridge, Victoria, Australia, 
He was the eldest son of eight children to John Red Kelly, an Irish convict exiled to Australia, and Ellen Quinn. In 1869, Kelly found his first brush with the law when he was arrested for assaulting a Chinese farmer and was held in police custody for several days. In 1871, he was arrested for riding a stolen horse and fighting the police. As a result, he was sentenced to three years in prison at age 16. Kelly was released six months early from Pentridge Prison on the 2nd of February, 1874, for good behavior. In April 1878, Ned and his brother Dan Kelly went into hiding from the police after Ned was accused of shooting Constable Fitzpatrick when Dan was being arrested for horse theft. There are different accounts from both sides as to whether Kelly shot the constable or whether the wound was self-inflicted. Ned Kelly's mother and the others were arrested for abetting the attempted murder of Fitzpatrick. Ned and Dan Kelly, now on the run, were joined by fellow bushrangers Joe Byrne and Steve Hart, forming the Kelly Gang. In October, the gang killed three policemen who were tracking them during a shootout at Stringy Bark Creek. One of the police troopers, Constable McIntyre, escaped on horse and reported the killings. The Victorian Parliament outlawed the gang, and the reward for each gang member was raised to 500 pounds, dead or alive. The gang committed a series of armed bank robberies at the end of 1878 and early 1879 in rural towns. During this time, there were sympathizers for the outlaws, who kept an eye out for the police. Some supported the gang because Kelly was seen as a man of the people, a poor, working-class man against the wealthy landowners. Others, because of fear of reprisals to giving away the whereabouts of the gang to the police. As a form of protection for potential future bank robberies, Ned Kelly and his gang constructed armor made from plow mold boards. The padded iron armor featured a headpiece, breast and back plates, and an apron which altogether weighed about 97 pounds, or 44 kilograms. In June 1880, the gang, after killing a police informant named Aaron Sherritt, tried to derail a police train in Glenrowan by forcing two railway workers to damage the tracks. Dressed in the armor they had made, they had took hostages in the hotel there. When the police train arrived, it was stopped before it could be derailed, as schoolteacher Thomas Kernow had warned the driver. Earlier, Kernow had convinced the sleep-deprived Ned to release him. Ned did so and told him to go quietly to bed and not to dream too loud. Otherwise, they would shoot him. The police surrounded the hotel and a shootout commenced. During their last stand, the gang's lack of sleep and alcohol intoxication caused an overconfidence in the armor. The three gang members were killed, except for Ned. Ned had fired at the police with his revolver, and the police's bullet fire bounced off his armor. However, he was incapacitated when the police aimed at his legs, which had no protection. Ned Kelly was put on trial and sentenced to death by hanging. His last words were reported as, Ah, well, I suppose it has come to this and by other accounts as such is life. Kelly was buried in an unmarked grave, and it is presumed that his remains were dug up by souvenir hunters. In the 1970s, Ned Kelly's skull was stolen from a museum display and has not been found to this day. History of the Yakuza. Criminal organization, 17th to the 21st century. The Yakuza are members of a Japanese crime syndicate that were founded back in the 17th century, during the mid-Edo period. They very much see themselves as a Ninkyo Dantai, a chivalrous organization that prides itself on tradition, family, and maintaining a strict code of conduct. Whereas the Japanese police call them Moryokudan and see them as simply being a particularly powerful and violent mafia-style group. The name Yakuza was taken from a popular card game called Oichio Kabu. When drawn together and added up, the cards 8, 9, and 3 equals Yakuza, making the worst possible combination. So Yakuza basically means good for nothing. The Yakuza can be traced to two main groups which originated primarily from the Kyushu Islands, the Tekia and the Bakuto. The Tekia were peddlers or traders of illicit goods. The Bakuto were gamblers and were largely involved in gambling houses. The name Yakuza was associated with the Bakuto, at first, these gangs were just seen merely as a dishonest group of delinquents who sold fake and shoddy goods. They began to organize themselves into families with the structure of a father, the Oyabon, and the sons, the Kobon. 
But by the 19th century, they started to band together and get much more organized, moving into loan sharking, extortion, and running highly effective protection rackets. They soon spread all over Japan and were divided into clans, each with their own head and specializing in different forms of illegal business. The pyramid-like organizational structure was a complicated one. At the top of the Yakuza syndicate was the Kumicho, also known as the Oyabon, or father, while everyone who follows him were the Kobon, or children. Below the Kumicho are the officers. The first was the Saiko Komon, or senior advisor. He has his own advocates, accountant, and gang of children. Next in the chain of command as number two was the Wakagashira, who carries out the orders of the Kumicho and governs several gangs in the region. And the third position was the Shatte Gashira, who was the local boss. The foot soldiers below them are the Kyodai, or older brothers, and below them are the Shatte, or younger brothers. Under these are the junior leaders, known as the Wakashu. The children can form their own gangs, therefore the entire clan can grow into a large group with a lot of subfamilies. The largest Yakuza family, the Yamaguchi Gumi, was founded about 1915 by Harukichi Yamaguchi in Kobe, Japan, and fully developed after World War II by Kazuo Taoka. By the early 20th century, the Yakuza clans had become powerful male-dominated entities moving into loan sharking, money laundering, gambling, narcotics, extortion, bribery, smuggling, violence, and running highly effective protection rackets. Alongside this, they ran legitimate businesses such as construction, movie studios, nightclubs, security, insurance, and real estate, taking on the form and practices of large corporations. Soon, they were making billions and billions of yen a year from a mixture of legal and illegal activities. Yakuza members were usually working class, high school dropouts recruited from common street thugs. They were often descended from Burakumen and ethnic Korean backgrounds who were outcasts in Japan's history. The Yakuza used a Sakazuki to formalize the initiation process of new members into the family where they must take a blood oath of allegiance. The ritual, often performed at a Shinto shrine, involved the offering of a cup of sake to the initiate and the Yakuza leader known as the Oyabun and to the gods, a process known as Sakazuki Goto. Sitting face to face, the Oyabun's cup was filled to the brim, while the initiate gets much less to indicate their different status. They had to swear a sacred oath to never reveal the secrets of the organization, to never attack another member's family, to not withhold money from the clan to not fail to obey orders, and to not be involved with the law or police. And once you join the Yakuza, you are a member for life. For now, they become your family, and absolute loyalty to them was expected always. The Yakuza by now had become very ritualistic, seeing honor and loyalty as extremely important. There were several punishments for breaking the rules and betraying the clan, including lynching. Zetsuen, where the member was removed from the Yakuza family but was allowed to return after some time, and Hamonjo, where the offender was excommunicated and was no longer allowed to associate with or do business with the Yakuza group, banished from the Yakuza world forever. The fourth most famous punishment for an offense was Yubitsume. This is where you were expected to cut off a portion of the little finger on your hand and present it to the head of the organization as a form of sincere apology. Starting with the tip of the pinky and amputating further if more transgressions were committed, Yubitsume worked as a powerful deterrent to betraying the Yakuza family, being both a painful and permanent consequence of doing wrong. It can also be used to avoid a conflict. It is said that this ritual descends from the Bakudo group where if a person was unable to pay the gambling debt they owed, then Yubitsume worked as a form of repayment. The weakening of the hand diminished a member's ability to handle a sword, as the little finger is used to grip the hilt. This in turn makes the Yakuza member more dependent on the protection of his boss. Group members also wore lapel pins with their headquarters or clan logos. There was also Irezumi, and this was a very important part of Yakuza culture. This was where the member of the group had an elaborate full-body tattoo. Popular designs included dragons, koi, tigers, and snakes. It was an extremely painful and expensive process, carried out by skilled tattooists using sharpened bamboo needles. The process was so intricate that it could take several years to complete. The Japanese government during the Meiji period banned tattoos to make a good impression upon the Western powers, so the practice continued underground and soon became associated with criminals. In fact, tattoos would become so strongly linked to the Yakuza that public hot springs and gyms banned customers that had them on their bodies, something that stands today. 
By the 1970s, Yakuza influence had stretched far and wide within the Japanese society, even extending to the highest levels of government, to such an extent that they were implicated in a bribery scandal involving the U.S. Lockheed Company and the Japanese Prime Minister. It is said that Yoshio Kodama, a powerful Yakuza, acted as a consultant and facilitated a $3 million bribe to get the Japanese to buy Lockheed L-1011 TriStar passenger planes and a large number of F-104 Starfighters jet aircrafts. The 1980s saw the Japanese economy boom, driven by massive exports to America and Europe. The Yakuza quickly capitalized on the opportunities this newfound prosperity brought, but this in turn led to infighting amongst the various factions in the Yakuza. Such conflict, though rare, often proved to be incredibly violent, but normally short-lived. Worrying for the police on this occasion, it quickly escalated to open, unrestricted warfare, and the factions seemed to care little about who got hurt in the fighting. In the Japanese city of Fukuoka, it got completely out of control as gun battles between the various factions were becoming commonplace and civilians were becoming hurt or killed on a regular basis. The police took a tough stance against the Yakuza, and the subsequent crackdown did not only bring about a public declared truce between the warring factions, but also marked the start of the decline in power and influence of the Yakuza, as the police finally took a proactive approach against them nationwide. By the 1990s, the Yakuza had moved with the times and become much more international, having formed alliances with various Korean and extremely violent Vietnamese gangs, as well as the Chinese triads. In the process, cornering the Asian market in illegal handguns and human trafficking. Infighting between the Yakuza is rare, as they see it being counterproductive and harmful to their reputation for being a unified group. But in 2007, there was violence between two powerful factions, when one side assassinated Ryochi Sugiura, a leading senior member of the Sumiyoshi Kai, the second largest Yakuza family, by ambushing his limo using gunmen riding motorcycles. But a strong police crackdown meant the violence never escalated much farther. At its peak, the Yakuza clan members could number as many as a quarter million, but over the last few decades, their numbers have declined dramatically. Since 2011, there's been regulations that prohibit business with the Yakuza. Yakuza exclusion ordinances, which are aimed to eliminate the relationship of citizens with the Yakuza, have also been enacted. Changing attitudes, constant police crackdown, and the introduction of several anti-corruption laws in Japan has affected them badly. But this is not to say they are still not a force to be reckoned with. Having adapted with the times, they have spread overseas to other parts of Asia, as well as America, moving into new developing markets. And in recent years, they have started to realize the importance of PR, and in an attempt to improve their image, were heavily involved in providing disaster relief after the Kobe earthquake of 1995 and the Tohoku tsunami of 2011. This proved highly effective and has done much to increase their popularity in recent years. Britain's Most Violent Prisoner The 20th Century Charles Bronson was born Michael Gordon Peterson on December 6, 1952, in the town of Luton, Bedfordshire, England, to Era and Joe Peterson. He was also one of three brothers and was from a respectable family. By all accounts, he was a nice and likable child, but as he grew up and became a teenager, he started to get more and more into trouble. During his school years, he was constantly playing truant, preferring a life of petty crime. But more worryingly, a nasty streak started to emerge in him as he enjoyed more and more getting into violent fights. After Peterson left school, he had trouble holding down steady employment. He ended up doing a number of different jobs over the next few years, including working in a supermarket where he attacked his manager, on building sites, in various factories, and even as a furniture remover. But none of these jobs lasted very long, and more often than not, he was quickly fired for his abrupt manner and fierce temper. The only thing Peterson seemed to have an affinity for was crime. In the three years after he left school, he got into trouble for a variety of things, like smashing up parked cars after an argument with his girlfriend's father, crashing a stolen lorry, and being involved in a smash-and-grab raid. But luckily for him, each time he was only fined and given probation. 
Then it seemed that he may well had learned his lesson and grown out of this rebellious and self-destructive stage, for in 1971, at the age of 19, he met Irene Kelsey. They fell quickly in love and married the following year. Shortly afterwards, they were blessed by the birth of a baby boy. But soon he was back to his old ways, and in 1974, he was convicted of the serious crime of armed robbery and sentenced to seven years' imprisonment. During this time, Irene divorced him, and his incarceration turned out to be a lot longer than the original sentence, as he earned an extra six years for repeatedly attacking prison guards and fellow prisoners, often with broken glass bottles, as well as for damaging prison property. He was seen as such a dangerous inmate that he had to spend long stretches of time in solitary confinement, and at times he had to be sedated or kept in chains as he was so unstable and violent. Peterson ended up in a high-security psychiatric ward. His behavior then became even more erratic, and he staged several rooftop protests as well as a short-lived hunger strike. When he was finally released in 1987, after 13 years in prison, he embarked on a short-lived career as an illegal bare-knuckle boxer in the East End of London. He adopted the stage name of Charles Bronson, who was a famous American actor in the 1960s and 70s, who often played tough law enforcement officers or moralistic vengeful vigilantes. Just a year later, he robbed a jewelry shop, surprising his girlfriend with a ring and selling off the rest. Charged under his fighting name, Charles Bronson, he gave up his old name of Peterson. After 69 days of freedom, he was back in custody, convicted of armed robbery for robbing a jewelry shop, and was sentenced to another seven years in prison. Once again, Bronson was far from being a model prisoner. He continued to attack prison guards and fellow prisoners, so much so that he had to be moved numerous times, and his reputation became so bad that one prison in Bedford refused to have him. By attacking others, he was not only adding to his sentence, but also earning transfers between prisons. Subsequently, because of his antisocial behavior, he again spent a considerable amount of time in solitary confinement. Surprisingly, he only served four years of his sentence and was released from prison in 1992. In a few months, he was back inside again, accused of planning a robbery, though the charges were eventually dropped. But he was found guilty of assault for breaking the nose of the boyfriend of an ex-girlfriend. And despite his criminal and violent past, he escaped prison time and was given a 600-pound fine. You would have thought that Bronson might have tried to control his anger issues, but just 16 days later, he was again arrested. This was for planning another robbery and for illegally possessing a sawn-off shotgun, a very serious crime in Britain, which has some of the toughest anti-gun laws in the world. While he was on remand, he did not help the situation by taking a librarian hostage, demanding, among things, a helicopter, an inflatable doll, and a cup of tea. Bronson was disgusted at the hostage when he farted in front of him, so he released him. The situation was then defused by the police negotiators, who never gave him his helicopter. There is no record if the police gave in to his demands for a cup of tea. At his trial, Bronson was found guilty for possessing a shotgun and was given an eight-year sentence in 1993. His behavior was now getting totally out of hand, and in 1994, he took the deputy governor of Hull Prison hostage for four hours. Then the following year, he attacked the governor of High Down Prison in North Surrey. It didn't stop there. In 1996, while in Birmingham Prison, he took a doctor hostage, which luckily ended peacefully. Later that year, he took three fellow prisoners hostage and made more colorful demands like asking for a plane to take him to Libya, as well as an Uzi submachine gun, 5,000 rounds of ammunition, and an axe. He also demanded ice cream and slashed himself with a razor before surrendering. A further five years was added to his sentence for these offenses. But Bronson's disruptive behavior kept on continuing. In 1999, he took a civilian education officer hostage for 44 hours and went on a rampage because he criticized one of his drawings. He wrecked part of the prison, damaging fridges, washing machines, and furniture as he did so. Finally, the authorities had no choice but to give Bronson a life sentence as he was obviously a habitual and violent criminal. They could see he was beyond rehabilitation and forever a danger to the public and himself. The sad truth of the matter was that in the last 25 years, he was only out of prison for a grand total of six months. 
Because he was such a difficult prisoner, they were forced to build a special high-security unit at Woodhill Prison to house him and other ultra-violent prisoners. But finally, things did seem to change in Bronson for the good when he married a mother of one Bangladeshi divorcee who had only just started to visit him. Bronson converted to his new wife's faith and for a time Bronson started to call himself Charles Ali Ahmed. He seemed for a while much more stable and it looked like married life had a calming effect on him. But in 2005, after four years of marriage, the couple divorced and he renounced his faith. By 2007, he was back to his old ways and prison guards narrowly avoided yet another hostage situation. Several times Bronson appealed against his life sentence, as well as requesting parole, but he was refused every time. In 2013, he even appealed to British Prime Minister David Cameron to be released, backed up by a petition of 10,000 signatures supporting this request. However, this request was point-blankly denied. Then in 2014, Bronson legally changed his name to Charles Salvador in honor of one of his great idols, Salvador Dali the Spanish surrealist painter. With Bronson's reputation for violent and destructive outbursts spanning over four decades, he may never be released from prison. His reputation for being the most notorious and violent prisoner in Britain is well-deserved, but what made him that way? Psychiatrists can't seem to agree what is actually wrong with him. It may well be that he is simply a man with a lot of anger management issues. For Bronson has said on many occasions he has a short, violent temper that he finds hard to control. Behind his violent exterior is someone who is well-read and said to be highly intelligent. Bronson is a talented artist, an award-winning poet, and a published author of a variety of books. He's also a fitness fanatic. And maybe he has finally calmed down, as recently, when much to his disgust, his prison served croquettes instead of chips at lunchtime. Rather than hold a person hostage or attack someone, he instead filed a strongly worded formal written complaint to the prison authorities. Fifteen improvised weapons inmates built in prison. Any prison show watcher will tell you that inmates can get very creative when it comes to life on the inside. Prisoners use many tactics to survive, including brewing their own moonshine, forming unlikely friendships, and of course creating weapons either for protection or for their own murderous agendas. There are plenty of weird and creative weapons made by prisoners across the world. Let's take a look at the top 15 craziest prison weapons you won't believe really exist. Number 1. The Shiv Let's start with the most obvious and prominent prison weapon, the Shiv, or Shank. Shivs are makeshift knives created from everyday materials that many inmates carry to protect themselves from their fellow prisoners. The features of a shiv generally change from prisoner to prisoner, with many different items used in innovative ways to create these deadly weapons. In the 1950s, British criminal Billy Hill offered an account of how he used his shiv. I was always careful to draw my knife down on the face, never across or upwards, always down, so that if the knife slips, you don't cut an artery. After all, shiving is shiving, but cutting an artery is usually murder. Only mugs do murder. The most common shivs are made from sharpened comb handles, shards of glass wrapped in cloth, or a razor blade tied to the end of a toothbrush. But if, for whatever reason, prisoners can't exploit these designs, they get creative. In Wolfenbüttel Prison, Germany, around 1994, a shiv was discovered inside a hollowed-out cross owned by a religious inmate. His intentions, it seemed, were far from saintly. Also worth noting is the bizarre circumstance surrounding the Hard Sweets Jolly Ranchers. These American candies are now banned from multiple prison commissaries after it was discovered that inmates had melted down the sweets and reshaped them with a cold, jagged tip that could very effectively stab someone. Number 2. Boiling Water, Sugar, and Chocolate this harmful process is commonly known as jugging or the sugar bomb. If you combine boiling water with sugar, it creates what prisoners call napalm. 
Named after the real gelatin substance, the prison-style mixture forms a paste that clumps and clings to the victim's skin, burning them horribly. One recent use of this popular prison weapon occurred in 2016, when inmate Paul McManus poured the mixture over fellow inmate Robert Wallace's head. The victim was reported to have shouted, I can't see, as the mixture burned him. Another similar method of jugging involved melting down chocolate bars and throwing the boiling chocolate over other prisoners, which, like boiling water and sugar, hardened and stuck to them as it burned. Number 3. Chili Bombs In the UK, the fear of sugar bombs has now been taken over by the fear of chili bombs in prisons. Inmates would buy chili from the prison canteen and crush it in hot water or vinegar before spraying it in the eyes of their victims. The effect is like being pepper sprayed and, in extreme situations, can result in blindness. Number 4. Homemade Bomb Around Halloween 1995, an Illinois prison inmate named Peter Saunders went as far as to mail a homemade detonation device to Judge Blanche Manning after becoming enraged that she had dismissed a civil lawsuit against prison officials. Saunders created the explosive device by rigging a hollowed-out book using a battery, electrical wires, and a marker pen packed with sulfur from ground-up matches. The bomb almost made it onto the judge's desk before it was discovered. Somehow, it had managed to pass through several security checks, including a prison x-ray machine, before being finally noticed in a second x-ray machine in the building where the judge resided. Saunders' public defender claimed that the package wouldn't have caused any damage if it had ignited and was just a cry for attention. Number 5. Can Lids When you open a tin of something, you usually end up with a jagged edge lid, which can be so sharp they're often used to cut food in prison kitchens, as the inmates aren't permitted to use knives. Of course, these are often stolen and smuggled into the prisoner's cells, as they make for handy little weapons that can slice quite deeply in a fight. Number 6. The Millwall Brick The Millwall Brick was named after the violent fans of Millwall Football Club. In the 1960s and 70s, UK football games were rife with hooligans and notorious for the extreme fights that broke out between the team's two opposing fan bases. Things eventually got so bad that anything remotely resembling a weapon was confiscated before fans could enter the pitch grounds. So the more enterprising footy hooligans created a weapon that became a favorite of prisoners in the UK, the Millwall Brick. The Millwall Brick is a simple, common weapon made with just newspaper, which is easily accessible to all prisoners. They would tightly roll the paper before wetting it under their cell sink. This would be repeated until you had a hard, solid knot of paper that had as much whack to it as a wooden club. Number 7. The Homemade Shotgun Peter Strudinger really didn't like life in prison. So much so, he attempted to escape twice using deadly weapons that were created from your common everyday items. Notably, during his first escape attempt in 1984 in Celle, Germany, Strudinger and an accomplice escaped using a shotgun made from the iron in their bedposts, pieces of lead from curtain tape, batteries, a broken light bulb, and the heads of matches. Despite his ingenious efforts, however, Strudinger was recaptured a day later in Bremen. Number 8. Zip Guns Homemade shotguns aren't the only guns found in prisons. Homemade zip guns and other small pistols are popular creations of inmates. Most of these zip guns are created using electrical wires, a nail, rubber bands, and matchstick heads with small bits of hoarded lead being used for bullets. A lot of them look nothing like the guns we know. They're small and are kept in separate pieces, only being assembled when needed. Number 9. Nunchucks 
In 2011, intrepid prisoner Lorenzo Pollard escaped St. Louis workhouse using nunchucks he'd made from a length of bedsheet and two chair legs. Unbelievably, Pollard kept over a dozen guards at bay by swinging the weapon wildly until he smashed a window using one of the chair legs, scaled two razor wire fences, and ran off into the sunset. Until a few hours later, when he was picked up and returned to his jail cell. Number 10. Anime Weapons Another case from 2011. This time, in a prison in Munmusher, Wales, guards were astonished to find a whole host of replica anime weapons created by an inventive prisoner with a particular fondness for the Final Fantasy series. The anime-loving inmate had painstakingly used hundreds of toothpicks to create at least six of these weapons. Although they were discovered before they were used, the prison's governor, Steve Cross, said they presented a genuine threat as they had been sharpened to points that could cause serious injury. Number 11. Coffee Creamer Coffee Creamer is now banned from a lot of prison commissaries after one too many inmates discovered another use for it as part of a flamethrower. It turns out that a lot of powdered coffee creamers contain animal fat, which can be lit on fire and channeled through a bit of tube to create a flamethrower effect. One assistant warden of a Texas prison once said the inmates would roll up a piece of paper, place some coffee made in it, put a cigarette lighter in front of it, blow it out, and it's just like a flamethrower. Prisoners could also toss a handful in the air before whipping out their lighter to create a fireball effect that could easily scorch someone passing by. Number 12. Dental Floss Dental floss is yet another item that a lot of prison commissaries have banned, as well as being used in many escape attempts. Due to its tensile strength, it can also make an effective weapon to choke out another prisoner or guard, or used as the hand grip on a shank. Number 13. A Knuckle Duster This one is considered particularly creative. Around 1993, a guard in a German prison uncovered a dangerous homemade rasp knuckle duster in an inmate's cell. The inmate had stolen the rasp tool from the prison's machine workshop and, using material ripped from their bed as padding, arched the rasp in such a way that it formed an effective knuckle duster. Being on the receiving end of a punch made from it could, no doubt, do some serious damage. Number 14. Gardening Glove even gardening gloves can be used to form dangerous weapons. Because secretly modified gloves look just like the ordinary ones, prisoners could carry them around without drawing much attention to themselves. Prisoners would sew one glove inside the other, but would line the inside glove with tacks or any other small, sharp, pointed object. The spiked lining would then easily penetrate the top layer, seriously hurting anyone on the receiving end of a punch or blow. Number 15. Toothbrush Crossbow Last but not least, we have the Toothbrush Crossbow. The Toothbrush Crossbow is one of the most inventive and complicated prison-made weapons in history. Created in 1998, it so impressed the prison guards that found it that they later put it on display in Canada's Penitentiary Museum, where it can still be viewed today. A prisoner at Stony Mountain Institute, Canada, was stuck in solitary confinement when he came up with a creative and deadly use of his time. Using a small list of everyday items, including 10 toothbrushes, a lighter, part of a ballpoint pen, a small piece of wire, some cafeteria tongs, yellow gloves, assorted electrical wires, a Kleenex, and a few screws, he managed to fashion what was effectively a fully functional crossbow. He created created bolts for it using aluminum foil, tightly rolled paper, and Q-tips. Although the prisoner never got a chance to use his new creation, the prison guard that confiscated it had a go at the impressive weapon and reported that it could fire up to 40 feet. Imagine the chaos that would cause in the prison yard. The FBI Hostage Rescue Team the Federal Bureau of Investigation is responsible for domestic policing and security in the United States, with roles that include enforcing federal law, protecting against foreign intelligence gathering and counterespionage, forensics, undercover operations, and other law enforcement duties. One of these additional functions includes counterterrorism, 
And to this end, the FBI hostage rescue team was founded. In 1972, the Olympic Games in Munich, Germany were interrupted when 11 Israeli athletes were held hostage and later executed by Palestinian gunmen, shocking the international community. In order to prevent a similar incident at the 1984 Games in Los Angeles, it was clear that tighter security arrangements were needed. The HRT has numerous responsibilities, including hostage negotiations, mobile assaults and rescue activities, counterterrorism duties, including nationwide manhunts, maritime operations, which could involve the physical boarding of seagoing vessels, the removal of suspects from barricaded buildings, high-risk raids and arrests, as well as undercover and surveillance operations, sometimes providing personal protection for FBI agents working abroad. Following their motto of Servare Vitas, or to save lives, the HRT has been involved in over 800 incidents both at home and abroad. The hostage rescue team is organized along similar lines to SEAL Team 6 or Delta Force, giving the unit the nickname Domestic Delta, and its creation relied heavily on advisors from SEAL Teams, Delta Force, and the British Special Air Service. There are roughly 150 members of the HRT, divided into three separate teams, identified by the colors yellow, blue, and red, which has been designated for maritime operations. Each of these teams consists of an assault group, including a sniper and observer. They are supported by air assets in the form of tactical helicopter units and a mobility team, which utilizes their ground-based vehicles. The HRT is also supported by a command element, intelligence, logistics, and communication sections. As criminal and terrorist activities do not follow a standard pattern, the HRT's exact composition is flexible, being able to change the structure of the team to suit specific missions. They can also work alongside other similar organizations, such as SWAT teams or military forces. Becoming a member of the hostage rescue team is a strenuous affair. There is a two-week initial selection period, which includes demanding physical exercises, consisting of seemingly countless push-ups, pull-ups, climbing stairs, and long runs while wearing 55-pound weighted vests and carrying a 35-pound door breaching battering ram, all of which are done on limited sleep. The candidates are also evaluated on their marksmanship skills, the ability to work as a team, and their ability to remain calm under pressure. To add to the stress, the candidates are not given any feedback from the instructors, only learning of their performance at the end of the selection process. Over half the candidates wash out during this stage. Once selected, the remaining candidates undergo a multi-month training course, which involves close-quarter combat, scuba diving, fast roping from helicopters, and other skills necessary for participation in the HRT. Should the recruit pass this phase, they will be inducted into the HRT as a provisional member for a year. Because the training is designed to be as realistic as possible, including the ever-present danger from using live ammunition, injuries are common and a reported four candidates have been killed during training. Once inducted into the HRT, the operatives continue their training on an ongoing basis, honing their skills for when they are needed. They cross-train with other similar special operations units, including the Navy SEALs, Delta Force, DevGrew, Army Rangers, as well as Border Patrol, DEA teams, and others. As with any profession, the right tool is essential for the successful completion of a given task, and the HRT is no exception. The teams make use of a wide variety of weapons, the exact loadout changing based on the circumstances. Among the most commonly used weapons in their arsenal is the ubiquitous M4 carbine, a variant of the M16 rifle, the standard issue weapon for US forces since the 1960s. Chambered in 5.56 by 45 mm, this versatile weapon incorporates a Picatinny rail system, allowing accessories including scopes, laser pointed sights, illumination devices, and other equipment to be attached. It can also be configured with a wide array of barrel lengths, stocks, and other features, allowing it to be tailored for individual needs. The HRT also uses the HK416, a variant of the M4, manufactured by the German company Heckler & Koch, a weapon that has gained favor with special operations teams in recent years. For more close quarter combat, the HRT utilizes multiple versions of the HK MP5, particularly the MP5SD6 variant. This submachine gun fires a 9mm parabellum cartridge and has an integrated suppressor built into the muzzle of the firearm. Like all MP5 variants, its compact size makes it an ideal choice for operations in confined spaces, a feature that is enhanced by its retractable stock. It can also be fired in semi-automatic mode or in three-round bursts. 
The HRT also uses the MP510A3, which is an MP5 variant chambered in 10 mm The hostage rescue team also makes use of shotguns, particularly the semi-auto Benelli M4 and the pump-action Remington 870, both chambered for 12-gauge shells. Both of these powerful weapons are a great asset in close-quarter combat, supplementing the MP5. They are also very versatile, capable of being loaded with specialized breacher shells, which are able to blow the locker hinges off the door, allowing easy access into barricaded rooms. For long-range assignments, the HRT uses several precision rifles. These include the 308 caliber Remington M40A1, the Barrett M107, chambered in 50 caliber BMG, both of which are bolt-action. The hostage rescue team also has a specialized sniper rifle at its disposal, manufactured by Georgia Precision. This bolt-action rifle features a detachable 5 or 10 round box magazine of 308 cartridges, with different scopes available for long-range accuracy. Some of the sidearms include the 9mm Glock 19 and 26, the 40 caliber Glock 23, and the venerable Colt 45 1911, manufactured under contract by Springfield Armories. The Tactical Mobility Team, which supports the HRT, transports the teams in a wide variety of vehicles. These include modified pickups with assault ladders to reach access points above ground level, as well as a fleet of SUVs which are manufactured by American automaker Chevrolet. They also have access to military surplus HMMWV, or Humvees. For something more substantial, the Tactical Mobility Team uses 8x8 Bison Light Infantry vehicles. When the need arises, there is also an air mobile element available to the HRT. The tactical helicopter unit uses the UH-60 Blackhawk and variants of the Bell 412 and 407 models. These vehicles allow the HRT to deploy quickly and access roofs or other hard-to-reach locations, allowing a greater degree of tactical flexibility. In its years of service, the hostage rescue team has been deployed in over 800 operations. Some of the more notable ones include helping put down the Talladega prison riot in 1991. After 121 inmates took control of the federal prison and held several guards hostage, the HRT was deployed to the site, blasting holes in the exterior walls and subduing the inmates. There were no casualties on either side. As recently as 2022, the HRT was called upon to end the Colleyville Synagogue hostage crisis. The HRT breached the building, then tossed a series of stun grenades into the room where the gunmen and the hostages were being held. The hostage taker was shot and killed, and the civilians were able to escape without any loss of life. They have also been deployed twice to Libya, assisting Delta Force in the capture of Abu Anas el Libi in 2013, and in 2014 with the capture of Ahmed Abu Katala, who had been the architect of the 2012 Benghazi attack. Among the many other exploits, in 1998, an HRT sniper prevented a man from killing his girlfriend and son during a hostage situation. In 1992, they were pivotal in ending another prison riot in Alabama. The HRT is not without controversy, though. In 1993, they were deployed with a number of other law enforcement agencies at the Waco siege, where cult leader David Koresh and over 100 Branch Davidians and their families ensconced themselves in their sprawling compound. After a 51-day siege, the building was stormed. During the incident, the compound caught fire, which spread rapidly throughout the buildings. In the confusion that followed, 76 of the Davidians were killed, including a number of children and non-combatants. Four ATF agents were also killed in the conflict. Today, less than 300 FBI agents have been inducted into the hostage rescue teams. In spite of this small number, their dedication and skill have proven to be invaluable in upholding their motto, to save lives. SWAT, Police Tactical Unit. Within the world of special forces, a unique place is held by police tactical units. A specialized unit within a police force, they more often resemble tactically equipped soldiers rather than a normal street police officer. These units are trained to handle situations beyond the capabilities of standard police departments. Using military-grade weaponry and equipment, these tactical units are able to tackle counter-terrorism operations, hostage situations, search and arrest warrants, and other dangerous situations that are threatening public order. Over the past few decades, many of these distinctive units have become world-renowned fighting forces. These include the French GIGN, the German GSG-9, Israeli Yamam, the Russian Spetsnaz, the Brazilian Bope, and the Mexican Gopes. 
However, the very first of these tactical units was founded in the United States in the 1960s. Named SWAT, it's now synonymous across the globe, so much so that it's often used as a universal term for these specialized police units. In the aftermath of World War II, life in the United States began to change. The streets of America's cities saw some of the most prominent changes, most notably a dramatic increase in violence as well as crimes carried out by organized criminal gangs. The decades of the 1960s was marked by antisocial behavior, criminal activity, frequent riots, and even mass shootings. These new threats were beyond the ability of most American police officers who were armed and trained to maintain order in relatively peaceful communities. It was quickly realized that police units that were specially trained to handle these dangerous and volatile situations were desperately needed. After events such as the 1966 shooting in Austin, Texas by Charles Whitman, an ex-Marine who fired down on the general public from an observation platform on top of the University of Texas's main tower killing and wounding many people before being shot dead by police himself. There were also the mass riots in California to contend with. John Nelson, an officer of the Los Angeles Police Department, was the first to think of such an idea. He initially proposed the formation of a special police unit to a senior police inspector, Darrell Gates, in 1964. The concept was soon authorized and put into action with the introduction of a special police unit of 15 four-man teams. Officers were armed with military weapons that were not typically issued to police officers. The rationale behind this was based on the proposed scenario of officers confronting heavily armed criminals who would otherwise have far superior firepower. The unit was named SWAT, an acronym for Special Weapons Assault Team. On the recommendation of his superior, Deputy Police Chief Ed Davis, Inspector Gates changed the official designation to Special Weapons and Tactics. Officers from all over the LAPD volunteered for the service. Inspector Gates chose applicants with prior military service and specialized experience with weaponry and tactics. The role was regarded as having a special status and came with numerous additional benefits. SWAT officers, however, were required to attend intensive monthly training to maintain a quality of service. Their first significant engagement came in 1969 with a major confrontation with members of the Black Panther Party. In a densely populated area of Los Angeles, 40 SWAT officers stormed the party's headquarters. The Panthers barricaded themselves inside and responded with gunfire, which led to a shootout that lasted for over four hours. The SWAT officers were armed with semi-automatic rifles and even requested permission to use a grenade launcher. When the shootout was over and the Panthers had surrendered, four Panthers and four officers had been injured. LAPD officials realized that the job would never have been accomplished without the SWAT officers. In 1971, teams were assigned full-time to the Los Angeles Police Department's Metropolitan Division, an elite unit within the LAPD. The Special Weapons and Tactics Unit was also given the new designation of D-Platoon. Five years after the Black Panther shootout, LAPD SWAT were involved in another similar incident which involved a group of radical left-wing militants who called themselves the Symbionese Liberation Army. A small number of these militants had fortified a house in the Compton area of Los Angeles, and a standoff between them and several SWAT units commenced. The assault on the house killed six of the militants, and eventually the house itself caught fire, killing the remaining fighters left inside. There were no SWAT injuries or fatalities throughout the incident, once again proving the effectiveness of the elite unit. The shootout also led to the subsequent decision to arm SWAT units with fully automatic weapons to enable them to return heavy fire. The Symbionese Liberation Army shootout brought even further reformations to the unit, with the presentation of official rules of engagement for SWAT in the incidents report. It was decided that the units were to concentrate on four main threats – riots, sniper attacks, political assassination attempts, and urban guerrilla warfare. As cited in the report, quote, The purpose of SWAT is to provide protection, support, security, firepower, and rescue to police operations in high personal risk situations where specialized tactics are necessary to minimize casualties, end quote. In the decades following the formation of SWAT, the organization, tactics, and mission have consistently evolved. For example, the war on drugs was the primary focus of SWAT operations in the 1980s and 1990s, and continues right up to the present day. 
During the years following the 9-11 attacks, SWAT teams have also become involved in counter-terrorism. The success of the LAPD's SWAT units was a clear demonstration of its importance in modern policing. From the 1970s onwards, many other police departments across the country adopted their own special operation units. This also included the FBI and military police. Uniforms the original SWAT uniforms were typically a distinctive black or blue color with inscriptions of SWAT or police or sheriff on the back and front. The headgear consisted of either surplus World War II era steel helmets or fiberglass motorcycle helmets that provided very limited protection. As time passed, Kevlar-based PASGT ballistic helmets were introduced, which offered far more protection as well as being lighter and more compact. More recently, most SWAT units have abandoned the traditional black or blue police uniform colors and switched to standard battle dress uniforms with camouflage patterns, more akin to military fatigues. For the purpose of police tactical operations, some military uniforms are modified by removing cargo pockets on the trousers and upper and lower blouse pockets and adding them on the sleeves. On top of the uniform, SWAT officers also wear ballistic tactical vests. While fairly bulky, they offer all the protection required for missions in hostile environments. Weapons The first SWAT teams generally used M1 carbines, mass-produced in World War II and therefore readily available. A landmark weapon of the units, however, was the Heckler & Koch MP5 submachine gun. This delayed blowback roller-locked system weapon was extremely reliable and suitable for clearing of cramped interiors. Even so, the weapon had one major flaw. It had a considerably low stopping power, only firing 9mm rounds. Thus, it began to fall out of favor and was instead replaced with the 5.56mm round carbines, namely the Colt CAR-15 and the M4. Shotguns have also been a stable weapon of the U.S. police forces since the very earliest days of law enforcement. SWAT teams have made equal frequent use of them for their heavyweight firepower. Many units carried Remington 870 shotguns. However, from the late 1980s, these were largely replaced with the more modern Italian-made semi-automatic Benelli M1 shotguns. These weapons were almost always used in tandem with assault rifles due to the limited range of the shotgun. SWAT sniper teams usually use the American-made Remington 700P, the police version of the bolt-action center-fire rifle. Each SWAT team member also has a pistol holstered to their side. These are usually semi-automatic pistols, for example the Colt M1911 pistol series, Beretta 92 pistols, Sig Sauer P226 and P229, and the FN57. Due to the special conditions of the mission, SWAT teams also make frequent use of non-lethal weapons. Depending on the scenario, they have access to tasers, tear gas, pepper spray canisters, pepper ball guns, shotguns loaded with beanbag rounds, stinger grenades, and flashbang stun grenades. Formation The size and formation of a SWAT team often varies depending on the police department. However, there are typically two distinct elements, a sniper and observation team providing overwatch, along with an entry team for entering and clearing hostile areas. The number of men in each SWAT team is also generally divided into three types, four-man, six-man, and eight-man. In reality, these numbers are not static and often adapt to the differing factors of a mission. The basic structure of a SWAT four-man team consists of the team leader, who coordinates the movement of the team, a scout, who leads the team from the point and provides cover at the forward position, a cover man who provides covering fire for an assigned teammate, covers danger areas as they appear, and can act as an assaulter and perform other duties as directed by the team leader. Rear Security – an alternate scout responsible for providing security and protection to the rear of the formation. An eight-man team differs from a four-man team by having an assistant leader and four cover men. The sniper team usually has two members who focus on overwatch, providing observation, intelligence, and fire support, quite often situated on rooftop positions. Recruitment and Training While the recruitment procedure varies slightly from one police department to another, the unit is based on serving officers volunteering to join, as long as they meet the rigorous requirements. Maintaining a perfect level of physical fitness is a standard requirement for all SWAT officers, so physical training is essential. Various exercises, including long-distance runs in full tactical gear as well as obstacle courses, are always on the agenda. Marksmanship is naturally an equally important skill. 
All SWAT officers are required to be able to handle all weapons in the arsenal, regardless of their specialty. In addition, they're required to be a master marksman. To achieve this, the officers regularly spend many hours practicing firing in realistic scenarios, identifying hostile and non-hostile targets, and firing into barricaded rooms. Individual training, team exercises, or simulations of combat situations are also given great attention. Further specialized training includes sniper courses, explosives handling, surveillance techniques, and hostage negotiation methods. Officers are expected to become trained negotiators. Weaponry and equipment play a vital role in the effectiveness of these SWAT units. However, it's often stressed that a well-functioning unit only comes together when strong team unity is established. As the saying goes, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Shooting Positions One of the easiest ways to tell the difference between amateur and professional sharpshooters is how they choose to handle their weapons. Different gun stances will reveal the comfort and experience someone has when handling a gun. A professional soldier will hold a weapon with confidence that they know how to operate and maintain it for the best results. At the same time, someone with little experience or informal training will have an underlying stress level when holding a gun. As with any foreign subject, gun operation is a learned skill and one that comes after years of experience. This is because it's not just the way someone handles a gun that's indicative of their experience level, but the way they react when something goes wrong with their weapon. Knowing how to quickly clear a jam or fix the sights on a weapon while under attack can only come with training and exposure to hostile environments. While it is easy to sit in the comfort of home and take a gun apart piece by piece to examine it thoroughly for defects, being able to perform this same task while being shot at is a skill few possess. Likewise, it's easy to work on weapon grip and correct breathing techniques at the gun range, but remembering how to properly handle a weapon safely while in combat can mean life or death. Five of the most common gun positions for soldiers, hunters, and anyone looking to improve their shot are prone position, the weaver stance, the powerpoint stance, the Harry's technique, and a stance from the Soviet Manual of Arms. Some positions, such as the prone position, can be used for both handguns and rifles, but other stances, such as the weaver stance and Harry's technique, are used exclusively for handguns. There are both positive and negative elements to each stance. However, all five stances are renowned for their ability to allow marksmen fast, accurate target acquisition. Here's a closer look at each of them. The prone position. This means that the shooter should be lying flat and their head facing downward. This position is mostly associated with snipers and other gunmen who must remain hidden while shooting. Prone positions are utilized for their long-range capability and offer the shooter the most stable shot. However, they're not often used in the field due to natural obstacles that can inhibit the eyesight of the marksmen, such as dense vegetation and tree branches. The key element to a successful prone position is good bone contact with the gun. Shooters don't want to use their muscles to stabilize the barrel. They want the leverage of a large bone such as the non-dominant forearm or a cheekbone to rest the sight on. For right-handed shooters, this position should be centered around the left elbow. Some simple steps to get into a prone position are first getting down on the stomach, planting both elbows in the dirt for support, putting the gun stock in the cheek well, and then shifting their body weight for stability. The body should be positioned at an angle to the target or straight back, depending on the shooter's comfort. Alternatively, the shooter can use a backpack, folded clothing, or hand to prop up the weapon, and certain specialist guns have the facility to use a bipod for support. The left elbow should be used as a fixed brace in this position. While offering stability for long-range shots, prone positions need to be more reliable in many situations because of the unpredictable environment and visual obstacles. The Weaver Stance Developed in the 1950s by Los Angeles Deputy Sheriff Jack Weaver, this shooting method is one of the most popular two-hand stances used in combat-style matches. 
It was first developed to compete in leather slap matches, which were competitions in which individuals competed to draw and fire a shot at combat distance while being timed with a stopwatch. It's an aggressive boxer-type stance that requires the support side foot to be placed forward 8 to 10 inches and the strong side toes to be canted 45 degrees outward. The gun is presented to the target with both hands, with the strong side arm slightly bent and the support arm at a 45 degree angle. This technique creates a firm grip on the gun and allows a fast sight picture. The weaver stance offers advantages over other two-hand stances, such as a wider swing arc to support the side, making it easy to pivot quickly to the left or right, and fast sight acquisition at even longer ranges. As with any stance, however, it has its drawbacks, one being that shooters with cross-dominant vision will struggle to fire accurately. In addition, the stance requires an increased upper body strength to absorb recoil. The Weaver stance was nonetheless revolutionary and heavily studied by small arms enthusiasts, including Ray Chapman, a world-renowned sports shooter and firearms instructor. Chapman modified the Weaver stance to address the issues he saw and made it even more effective for shooters of all abilities. So if you're looking for a fast and powerful two-hand stance, the Weaver stance is the way to go. The PowerPoint stance. This is a valuable technique for those who need to quickly and accurately fire a handgun with either their strong or weak hand. This stance is one of the few gun holding positions that utilize a one-handed grip and it requires the gun side foot to drive forward 15 to 20 inches, with the shoulder pushing into the gun and the knees flexed, mimicking the motion of a boxer throwing a hard punch. The non-shooting hand is tucked tightly into the center of the chest, with the palm facing upward and the fist clenched to solidify the upper shoulder muscles and promote better trigger control. Proper technique is crucial with the PowerPoint stance, and it takes a significant amount of practice to hit a target with only one hand accurately. However, this stance is applicable in many scenarios, such as if the non-shooting hand is occupied or injured. The aggressive punch-to-the-target motion will still provide the accuracy and speed necessary for close-range shooting. It's worth noting that most two-handed stances are preferable to only using one hand to aim a handgun. However, the PowerPoint stance is the most accurate and reliable position that gives shooters an alternative in the event of an emergency. The Harry's Technique This technique is employed while working in dark spaces and utilizes a flashlight and handgun to provide light and protection. Most often associated with police and FBI personnel, this stance allows the shooter to move through buildings at night without sacrificing vision or accuracy. To use the Harry's technique, the shooter must hold the flashlight in their weak hand and then cross this hand under their gun hand. Next, pressing the back of the weak hand against the back of the strong hand will create isometric tension and stability to both the flashlight and the handgun. However, it is hard to push the strong hand against the weak hand and for many will cause fatigue after a short duration. This iconic technique is more stable than the FBI or neck index techniques, making it easier to index the light and the sights in the same place. Countless movies have shown this technique in action, and many brave officers have utilized it as they made their way into a dark building. It's a valuable technique to learn that takes advantage of the off-hand's hold on a flashlight to provide accurate shots in the dark. Soviet Manual of Arms during times of war, instructional magazines and manuals were issued to soldiers detailing how to best operate and maintain weapons and equipment. When the AK-47 rifle was introduced during the Cold War, a manual was also printed and detailed the best gun holding position to use while firing the weapon. What later became known as a Soviet-style grip is best characterized by the bowing out of the dominant hand and high placement of the gun stock next to the cheek. The non-dominant hand was placed comfortably under the rifle's forend or lower handguard and offered aim support. While this technique was easily learned and offered some control and accuracy over the weapon, one of the many problems with the stance was its inability to counter the tendency of the rifle to rise while shooting. The recoil of the AK-47 caused the gun to start lifting over its original placement and fire bullets over the target. Later, the Soviet-style technique would be transformed and improved to give the Red Army mastery over their weapons. These five gun stances, the prone position, weaver stance, powerpoint stance, Harry's technique, and Soviet manual of arms are all iconic and influential shooting methods that marksmen have used for years. Professional soldiers and experienced hunters alike have mastered these stances and used them to accurately and quickly fire off shots even in the most hostile environments. 
Although there's no way to guarantee that stress will not intervene and aggravate someone's ability to perform these stances, knowing how to get into them can save their life. The positions vary in their effectiveness and suitability for different weapons. However, all four have proven to be reliable and effective in their own right. It's clear that mastering the basics of any of these stances can turn an amateur marksman into a professional with enough practice and dedication. Ultimately, the key to becoming an effective marksman is to understand the basics of gun safety and operation, and develop the confidence and skill to operate a gun in any situation. So, if you want to prepare for a self-defense situation or better understand how contemporary gun stances evolved, starting with these five is the best way to learn about different gun-holding positions.